All right, hello everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Bonnie, um, and I'm the poetry event coordinator here at Brookline Booksmith. Today, it is of course my pleasure to host Marjorie and Agosim and translator Celeste kostopoulos uh for our third Thursday's poetry reading series. Tonight's event is of course particularly special for third Thursdays as we're celebrating Women in Translation Month um, and this beautiful bilingual book that we'll be hearing some poems from in just a bit. Um, so thank you all for being here. Before I introduce uh, our authors, I just have a few housekeeping notes. Um, so firstly, copies of Beyond the Time of Words are available for sale at the back counter over there. Um, I encourage you to support Celeste and Marjorie's work in whatever way you can, whether that means buying a book, saying nice things to them during the signing, following their work in general. Um, it's all appreciated, so thank you. Uh, also, please know the event is being live streamed on our iPad right over there. Um, generally, our audience is not a, uh, visible to our live stream viewers, but if you don't want to be live on YouTube, just don't walk in front of it and you will be totally fine. Um, and then finally, we will have a Q&A at the end of the event, so please hold your questions until the end, but definitely have them ready to go. Uh, this event is also part of a monthly reading series uh, taking place on, you guessed it, the third Thursday of each month here at Brooklyn Booksmith. Um, our September lineup is listed on our website if you'd like to check it out and you're interested in joining more poetry readings. Um, thank you again for being here. And now for the fun part, introduction. Celeste Costopoulos Cooperman is a professor emerita of Spanish and Latin American studies at Suffolk University in Boston. Her translations of Latin American women's poetry have appeared in numerous publications, including Agni, Harper's, the Massachusetts Review, and the Michigan Quarterly Review. She's translated six books of poems by Marjorie Agassin, including At the Threshold of Memory, Selected in New Poems, Secrets in the Sand, The Young Woman of Juarez, and Circles of Madness. Um, las uh, Circulos de yo? Locura. Locura, thank you. Uh, las Madres de la Plaza de Mayo, for which she received the American Literary Translation Award. And of course, Marjorie Agosin is a Chilean American poet who writes in Spanish, her native language. She's also a human rights activist and the Andrew Mellon Professor of the Humanities at Wellesley College. Her work has been inspired by the causes of so social justice and human rights. In addition to her numerous collections of poetry, she's written young adult novels, memoirs, and anthologies promoting international women's writers. So she's a particularly appropriate poet to be here tonight for Women in Translation Month. Among her many distinctions, she has been honored by the American Library Association with the Pura Belfre Award for her novel, I Lived on Butterfly Hill. She's also received the Gabriela Mistral Medal, the Chilean government's Medal of Honor for a Lifetime Achievement, a Fulbright Fellowship, the Jasper Winning Award for Travel, and the United Nations Leadership Award for Human Rights. To tell you all a bit about the book that we're gonna hear from, um, Beyond the Time of Words was composed during the time of isolation wrought by the COVID-19 pandemic. This bilingual book of poetry uh, embraces the, dark, the darkness of that pandemic with profound compassion and humanity. Born, as I said, in Chile, Agustin came to the United States as a political e exile and her prolific career has been inspired by both political activism and the pursuit of social justice. While bearing witness to our collective grief, these poems also offer reminders of bravery and ultimately hope. They are meant, the poet says, as the poet says, to cleanse and mend the world. I, for one, am so excited to hear you share from this collection. Everyone, please give a warm welcome to Celeste and Marjorie. Thank you very much for that very kind, beautiful introduction, Bonnie. Um, we thought we would start by just uh, telling you a little bit about when we started working together and this project in particular. Marjorie and I uh, met in the early 80s, so we have known each other for over 40 years. We haven't driven each other crazy. And we haven't driven each other crazy in between. Uh, there is a tremendous amount of trust that has developed between us through these 40 plus years, which is really essential when one is dealing with a living author and her translator, right? Because Marjorie has to 
trust me as much as I have to trust her with our words, our chosen words. So this project actually began, the seed of this project began when a Romanian uh, professor of Spanish um, invited Marjorie to write poems specifically for the pandemic. And the project was called, it was an online project called Cuenta Cuaranteras. So stories of, of, of quarantine, basically. Stories born out of quarantine. And Marjorie, of course, chose to write some poems. I translated them. And then we read them online. And they're still available with other poems, stories, songs. Uh, all kinds of creative uh, productions that people from all over the world actually wrote. And then one day as we were writing, Marjorie said, why don't we do a book together? You know, we had worked on, on other books previously, some prose, uh, most poetry, and the prose is very lyrical prose. And I said, sure, this is, what a fabulous idea. So in a way, beyond the time of words, más allá de las, del tiempo de las palabras, was our lifeline. It truly was our lifeline. Um, we didn't physically see one another during the time most of these poems were written. We didn't even Zoom, so we weren't looking at each other over Zoom. We talked a lot on the phone. Uh, we met in my driveway a couple of times. and. Uh, we sent a lot of emails back and forth, but it was really intense. And it was probably the most intense period of our friendship and collaboration ever. And uh, the result came about a year later, and 16 Rivers chose to publish us, which was quite an honor to be part of that collective in uh, California. And that's where we launched the book last year. In last August, we were actually there with a, a writer's collective and uh, read our poetry and, and, and shared these poems uh, with the community there. Whenever I read my translations and, and Marjorie's uh, original poems, I, I'm still very moved by the depth of emotion that each of them contains. And what drew me to Marjorie in the first place as a translator is her fearlessness, her willingness to approach the most evil, most dark parts of, of life, of humanity, but to not to, to never succumb to that darkness, to always find hope and to always offer people an opportunity to continue to imagine and to dream and to believe that life isn't all the darkness, <laughs> that there's a lot of beauty out there. So we, I hope that as when we read tonight, you'll, you'll see this hope that has sort of grasped my soul for these 40 plus years and that continues to, to make me want to translate even more, whatever Marjorie writes. Can I say something? <laughs> thank you, thank all of you for, for coming. For, I always, uh, ever since I started readings um, in my early 30s, I always say, who's going to show up to, to hear me? <laughs> But I'm always very grateful that so many of you are here. Uh, thank you, Bonnie, for inviting us. Thank you to this bookstore and to all the bookstores in the U.S. and hopefully the international bookstores that are celebrating women in translation. We are not celebrated enough. We are less translated than uh, lay writers. We still have uh, very little coverage on the press. And can you believe uh, in Latin America, that is uh, almost a continent, but the Americas, a part of this continent, 
of incredible writers. There's still only one Nobel Prize uh, winner, only one woman in the whole, uh, in the, in the whole of the Latin American region of uh, countries like uh, Brazil that has an incredible population, Argentina, she's still the only one. Um, so it's really important to celebrate women, to read women. Um, we write differently. Uh, we experience the world differently. And uh, we are not all Isabel Allende. Sometimes they think that because I'm from Chile, either they think I know her, or of course we are not, or I, I am her. We are different. We don't we don't really write all the time like Garcia Marquez, like an imaginary Matondo, but I, I think the essence of uh, Latin American women writers is plays, uh, memory, uh, engagement with, with history. I had just read, um, I, I am a snob for the New Yorker, I read it all the time, I think it's the best magazine ever in this country. And there was a poem that said, uh, written by a woman that said, um, women are the witnesses of war. Women are the ones that look for the daughter. Women are the ones that bury them. And I said, um, this woman it sounds like she's, she could be from Chile, she could be from Argentina. So I looked up her name and who she was, and she was from the Ukraine. But at the end of her biography, it said she died two months ago. In, in her apartment. So Shelly, you could look up this poem. It's in this this man's New Yorker. And the war was really brought very, very close to, to me. A, a fellow poet that brought so much of what I had lived and I had experienced. And the poem, of course, was translated from the Ukrainian uh, to English, and the, the sentiment came across. And that, because this is about translation. I think that I'm very grateful. And they have all, all been women that have translated my work. And I have a dear friend here, Jacqueline Alpito, who did a, a collection of poems about uh, the, the Sephardic, the remnants of the Sephardic Jews in uh, Greece. And, um, and, and a prose poems about a collection of a short story of Alan Grant. So for me, the translate, translation, tra the voices of women that have translated me are like voices, voices uh, to my world because I, I need to express myself um, in, the, in my own native language. I feel it in a different way than I feel the English language. And uh, because I don't aspire to be a commercial poet, I, I don't need to write poetry that will become a bestseller in English. So who, whoever wants to read my work will have to um, find this amazing, also w women that have created a new work of art through their translation. And curiously, I've never had a, a male translator, never. Uh, sometimes they will say, don't forget to clean up after a poem to read it. That's what they often do, so I am not interested. <laughs> Um, so, but I would also like to say that very recently I was in Spain. And Spain is very different than Latin America. Yes, we all speak Spanish, but the Spaniards are a force of nature. And they are very, very loud and very vibrant. And the Chileans are quiet, quiet in a way. But I felt so incredibly happy to be in Spain because I, w I wasn't translated. Sorry, Celeste. <laughs> I wasn't, I was myself in my own voice. How? And there were old, old ladies, young people, and they all understood. <laughs> and that was, at the same time, quite a, a very liberating feeling. But I live here, um, and I've lived for the past 40 years here this country, so uh, I am very grateful to the English language, uh, the most spoken language of the world, after no, second to Chinese, but Spanish is the third most spoken language in the world too, but 
but no one wants to acknowledge that. Uh, they say Chinese and English, but the other language is Spanish. So translation is a very um, generous act, because like Celeste said, you have to be uh, faithful to, to what the poet is saying. You have to trust. Uh, and I noticed so many people that translate different, in different ways. Celeste is very meticulous, and I am not. Uh, I keep everything in my head. I have a good memory, but I don't write anything, and I don't find anything which is said. But this line, this verse, uh, my experience with Jackie, you ask me more of general questions about the poem, the content. Then I work um, with a, a very prestigious uh, translator of Latin American novels, Jill Levine, and we did a collection of poems about the sea. But it's so interesting, she doesn't ask anything. She just thinks that she's going to translate uh, according to what she thinks it would be more, more beautiful and proper in, in the English language. So I just want to share with you, there are so many ways to translate and to approach a text, but we all know that this is truly a, the complexity of translation and the beauty is interpretation. So this is basically what I'd like to just say. Um, I don't, I don't sit around and say, okay, this year I'm going to write about COVID and next year about this. No. So this is how art works, and uh, artists are not crazy. They just hear different things in their brain, and they have muses, and and muses is the world around them. It doesn't have to be, because people say, where did you get an idea? Well, I don't know where I get an idea, but the idea comes from paying close attention to the world. So this book, um, I think the most important thing about language and words is what it is between words. Not, not what are the words, but what, what are the words ways of imagining? So when I, well, I never thought I'm going to write about the pandemic. I wasn't that scared about this pandemic, even though it's incredibly dangerous. I believe very, very much in science. But I was so aware of our privileges. We were not first responders. We were safe. If we got sick, we had access to health. And I think out of this privilege that I felt about my life, my family, my friends, I became very, very grateful. And then I just, uh, for me, COVID transformed me uh, in a profound way. And we're still finding how we are transformed by COVID. But to me, the challenges were, like Celeste said, life affirming. But um, what did silence mean? It didn't mean just silence. Science meant to hear the world we lost for a while, because we knew it was for a while, and to imagine the world we are, have now, and to use our senses, our isolation, to experience it. I was very happy. This sounds weird, but I was happy during COVID. I stayed home with my daughter and my husband. No one killed one another. And it was just a very, uh, a very good way to to be together, to be by ourselves. And I just began to write, and and I also will read a, a poem about it. I began to look at um, the symbols of objects that I never imagined before. When flower, uh, when hibiscus flower in Jan in February, and I said. I began to look for the signs of the universe. Um, and the universe does speak to us. So it spoke to me in a very um, essential way. And this is how this book um, came along. As Celeste, because of her translation, she won a very important prize for this, the New England C uh, Council of Latin American Studies. So we, we didn't even go get the prize, but, uh, and that was, uh, a strange thing, we just, we're happy to have received the prize. But um, 
this is how this book emerged. And I think this is all, this is how one writes. And all of a sudden, a sound, a phrase, and something has to trigger your writing imagination to, to begin. And the pandemic triggered so, so many things for all of us. Yes. Titled, I Yearn for Words. I yearn for words and embrace them while they pulse next to me. But when I search for them, they vanish and I end up voiceless. I just keep the taste of a memory and of unspoken words. Añoro palabra, the, the yearning for, for language. Añoro palabras y las acaricio mientras ellas laten junto a mí, pero cuando las busco se desvanecen y termino muda. Tan solo me quedo con el sabor de una memoria y de las palabras no dichas. Yes, it is. Thank you. about the hibiscus. <laughs> Bella. In this distant winter, when the shadows reveal what is invisible, when the old lanterns illuminate the elusive light, I am with you, my beautiful hibiscus, noble and loyal like the kindness of time. A hibiscus transplanted and in exile, in an uncertain land and a foreign climate where the earth does not smile. You pruned at midnight in February amid the mist and the shadows where I discovered you, open like a generous love, hiding nothing in the shadowy gardens of a world immersed in darkness. I gave you the name Bella to thank you for that instant happiness, for blooming at the wrong time, for accepting the imperfections of the shade, and for not abandoning me or being spared with your silences. I looked at you tenderly as one gazes at beauty telling you that I always want to live by your side. Your fragrance and your radiance make me aware of the light residing within us. I looked at you for a long time, not wanting to leave your side while you carried me to the height of happiness. So I'll read most of these poems for the sake of time. Bella, in este lejano invierno, cuando las sombras señalan lo invisible, cuando las viejas linternas iluminan la escurridiza luz, me encuentro contigo, mi hibisco, leal y noble, como la bondad del tiempo. Un hibisco trasplantado y en el exilio, en un país incierto, en un clima lleno donde la tierra no sonríe. En febrero floreciste a la medianoche, entre las brumas y las sombras, cuando te descubrí abierto como el amor, que nada esconde, que es generoso, en los jardines sombríos, de las noches del mundo. Te di el nombre Pela, para agradecerte por este instante de felicidad, por florecer a destiempo, por aceptar las imperfecciones de la sombra y por no abandonarme, ni ser parco en tu silencio. Te miré con ternura, como se mira la belleza, diciéndote que quiero siempre vivir a tu lado. Me hablaste de tu fragancia 
y de tu color como el sol, como la luz que llevamos dentro. Te miré por un largo tiempo, no quise irme de tu lado, mientras me llevaste hacia lo más alto de la alegría. The memory of words. What will the memory of certain words be like? The ones that we pronounced facing the waves so that only the sea could hear us? Will the words that say farewell to the dead have texture? What about the ones spoken to old lovers who never were? Will those who learn to let go leave behind sediments of loss embroidered in the vast silence of love? And what about the words of love? Those that share only an alphabet of two, for the one who gives and the one who receives them. And for heartbreak, what words can talk about the changing nature of love. Will the words of heartache have a certain appearance? What will the memory of the unspoken words be like? Those that are fearful, hidden, and uncertain, that hurt and do not go away. What will the memory of words spoken in silence be? Will they surrender themselves to the precipice of a broken time, a time among the shadows? So um, you will, you have heard these poems, and not so much Bella, but this the, the first one, the words, and I, Añoro palabras, and this one, um, the preoccupation with language to convey the emotions that we were all feeling. Uh, a lot of people uh, fell in love during COVID, a lot of people separated, a lot of people had, uh, had their children were born, other people decided, other couples decided to, to become childless. And the, the idea of love and the, the texture of, of love itself and, um, and, and what it means to almost live in isolation and in the shadows and what it means to, to have your inner light transforms you. And also, the more I think, the more I write, I, I believe uh, there is an there's a time where there is the impossibility of language to convey of complexity, emotion, what is the universe, what is a flower, what is our responsibility. And perhaps the next frontier is not really science, like we say in the science fiction shows, but the next frontier I think is music. And I think it's, it's, it's the silence that we all carry in us. So I'll just read two or three because it's a longer poem. La memoria de las palabras. ¿Cómo será la memoria de ciertas palabras? Las que pronunciábamos frente al oleaje para que tan solo el mar nos escuchara. ¿Tendrán textura las palabras que despiden a los muertos? A los antiguos amantes que tal vez nunca lo fueron. ¿Tendrán sedimento las palabras que aprenden a dejar ir, a perderlo todo, con tan, con tan solo una palabra bordada en el vasto silencio del amor y las palabras del amor, las que tan solo tienen un alfabeto para dos, el que dice, decides del amor, el que recibe los decides del amor y para el desamor, ¿con qué palabras hablar de una fugacidad? This next poem is a shorter one, much shorter, 
and it deals directly with the silence. Silence falls. Silence falls on the water's edge. It descends on the heavy swells. The night looms on a world that rests from words while the silence arrives as if it were holding strands of light. This silence wishes to be heard in the vastness of a voiceless world where we can only meet in a stillness. And this silence, like a radiant sign, will teach us how to sing to the world. Cae el silencio. Cae el silencio sobre la orilla del agua. Desciende el silencio sobre las manejadas. La noche se asoma al mundo que descansa de las palabras. El silencio se asoma como si en él guardara hebras de luz. Es este silencio que busca escucharse la plenitud de un mundo sin voces, donde tan solo en la que tú nos encontramos y es el silencio que como un signo radiante nos enseñará a cantarle al mundo. The next poem is one of the more whimsical poems of the collection. And it's about friendship and bonds that develop between people at all different times throughout our lives. And it's about the passage of time. Um, we're we're going to alternate um, verses on this one, Spanish and English. Um, I do believe uh, that even though we have a, a universality to our humanity, culture is incredibly important. time in America to, to, to love it, not to say I'm moving to Canada, but to try to fix it, because it's possible to mend it. But I also think this is a country totally radically different from the one I grew up in. And we were talking about this. This, this country offers us opportunities, possibilities, creativity. But the social life is very different. I sometimes feel, with the exception of of, of Mark and Mary, I think that people rather not see anyone. That and they have these notebooks where they write their appointments. The and by the, too, yeah. The <laughs> and by the time you you are ready to visit someone, six months have have, t have advanced, and, and what one doesn't know what's going to happen. I'm saying that the structure of social life is very different here. Perhaps people are busier. With, with, their, with their time, or perhaps they choose time to be more alone, which is, is perfectly valid. Where I come from in Latin America, the, the idea of privacy really doesn't exist so much. It really doesn't. So people knock at your door, and if you're busy, you say, please sit down and wait, or you stop everything. I have come to believe that people are the most important thing we can do for one another, and time, and making time for such things is it's the only thing that really is, is, really is worthwhile. The rest are professional gatherings. As soon as you finish a job, people will forget you. So anyway, um, in Chile, we have this expression that says, quédate un poquito, always, stay a while. Like, if people come at 6 p.m. for tea, it could be one at night. <laughs> and they simply to say, well, well, my husband is American, he's, he's getting used to this now, but people enjoy each other. And once you discover the beauty of enjoying your friends, the time you spend, your your heart will change and your your mind 
will also change your brain will change because I think the brain seeks the stimulation of company and of love. So uh, this is um, this could be a song, it could be put to music, but this is the idea of stay a while. So we will alternate this for Quédate un poquito. Aún el pan está tibiecito en nuestras manos. Quédate un poquito. El vino tiene el rostro de noche. Es un vino que nos escucha y que conversa. Stay a while. The bread is still warm in our hands. Stay a while. The wine is deep like the color of night. It is a wine that listens and speaks. Quédate un poquito. Cuéntame de ti y de tu pasado en los países de la guerra. Y yo te contaré de mis temores como los trenes que sollozan a medianoche. Stay a while. Tell me about yourself and about your past in war-torn countries. And I will tell you of my fears, like trains that weep in the middle of the night. Quédate un poquito, que corto es el amor, decía la luna, que largo es el olvido. Imagino que te digo que si uniéramos el amor y el olvido, tendríamos un mantel de secretos. Stay with me. How short life is, said Neruda. How long is oblivion. I imagine telling you that if we join together love and oblivion, we would have a tablecloth full of secrets. Quédate conmigo. La noche transita en silencio y estamos quietos como cuando imaginábamos a ser jóvenes. Stay with me. The night moves in silence and we remain quiet imagining our youth. Quédate un poquito. Juguemos a que no somos vistos. Juguemos a que nos acompañamos. Y si me tomaras la mano y si me bordaras con un beso el corazón. Stay a while. Let's pretend we are not seen. Let's pretend we accompany one another. What if you were to take my hand and embroider my heart with a kiss? Quédate un poquito. Escuchemos las ráfagas del tiempo que no perdura. Debemos creer en su bondad. Stay a little. Let's listen to the gusts of fleeting time. We should believe in his goodness. Quédate, quédate conmigo. Juntemos palabras. Bebamos un vino que nos refugia. Cuéntame de tu país y de tu primer amor. Stay with me. Let's join words together and drink a wine that will shelter us. Speak to me of your country and of your first love. Quédate un ratito mientras la noche pasa. Todo pasa también nosotros. Stay a bit while the night flows on. Everything passes, even us. Uh, sí. So, the list will be, and um, we can also alternate. Sure. The summer house, the last. Poem and put with you want to review. Um, and uh, it's so fitting that I, the past, uh, who said that? Albert Camus said that he always wanted to live in summer. I always want to live in summer. And this is the idea of the summer in our lives, the idea of, of summer in our homes. La Casa del Verano. La casa de madera trenzada por el sol nos aguardaba en el umbral de los vertiginosos silencios, guardando solo la lluvia y a musgo espeso, mientras sus paredes húmedas lloraban, como las mujeres que esperan el regreso de los hombres, de los que cruzan el mar en la noble pasión del oleaje. The house, the summer house. The house of wood, braided by the sun, awaited us at the threshold of vertiginous silences. 
storing her smell of rain and thick moss as her damp walls wept, like the women who wait for the return of men to cross the sea in the noble passion of the waves. En aquel invierno, cuando el mundo perdió sus nombres y sus palabras, cuando la única persistente certeza era nuestra desconfianza, cuando las manos inquietas se deslizaban junto a otras manos y dejaron de encontrarse, nos buscábamos con temor entre la niebla de los días y la severidad de la noche intentando amarnos en las sombras, mientras algo más allá de nosotros nos acechaba. In that winter, when the world lost its meaning and its voice, when the only enduring certainty was our uncertainty, when restless hands that slipped between other hands ceased meeting one another, we timidly looked for each other amid the daylight mist in the harshness of the night, trying to love one another in the shadows, while we were hunted by something beyond us. Acabamos de vivir una guerra incierta, guardados en casas carcomidas, por el desconcierto de los días, y por una enfermedad que crepitaba en el anonimato, entre los tiempos extraviados, Mientras añorábamos la casa del verano, la que se refugiaba en el medio del bosque, la que añoraba la dulce luz del amanecer y los racimos de estrellas que deambulaban por el cielo. We had just lived through an uncertain war, harbored in houses, decayed by the turmoil of the days, and by a sickness that crept in the anonymity of an unknown time. While we longed for the summer house, sheltered in the middle of the forest, yearning for the sweet light of dawn and the clusters of stars that wander through the sky. Okay. I, I skip four and, and begin with five. Llegó el verano y la casa nos volvió a invitar Nada escondía, ni siquiera sus muertos que habían vivido en ella. Vestida de azul nos aguardó con la fragancia del mar cercano, con la luz de sus estrellas amadas y, la claridad, y con la claridad de la hora. Summer arrived, and the house invited us back. She hid nothing, not even the dead who had lived in her. She awaited us dressed in blue, with the fragrance of the nearby sea, with the light of her beloved stars, and with the clarity of the now. Abrazada por la tierra, extendió sus alas y nos dijo, Vengan, aquí no hay temores ni olvidos, soy la casa del verano, donde la vida y la muerte se deslizan, donde llega la luz generosa y sencilla, y la música de todos los vientos aguarda las pisadas de los ausentes y de los que se atreven a soñar por reparar el mundo. Embraced by the earth, she extended her wings and said, Come, here there are no fears or forgetfulness. I am the summer house where life and death glide by, where the simple and the generous light arrives, and the music carried by the wind protects the footsteps of the absent and of those who dare to dream of repairing the world. Collection de we would welcome thoughts, questions, uh, issues about translation. I know that, you know, it's hard to ask questions about a particular poem, but 
you can just speak in general about the meaning of the, of this evening. Thank you both so much for sharing your work. Um, this is the part, this is the big moment for you, the audience. Uh, feel free to raise your hand if you have any questions and I'll call on you. There isn't one standard process to people of grace. There are many different ways to approach translation. In my more naive days, I thought that faithfulness meant staying as close to those original words as possible. But as Jorge Luis Borges, the famous Argentinian author, in a very legendary encounter, once told his translate, translator, don't write what I said, but what I intended to say. So every now and then, Marjorie would have a little chilerismo, you know, and, and that I wouldn't know. How, how would I know the origin of the word, right? Um, I know a lot about Chile, but every now and then there would be a nuanced word that wasn't part of my vocabulary. I would call her, I would write to her, you know, what is this, what is this, what are you talking about here? I think I know what you're talking about. And she would say, well, what do you think I'm talking about? And I would say, well, what I'm getting from this is whatever it was. And she would say, exacto, Celeste. And then she, and, and sometimes she would say, I like that English word. Let's use that. And I said, yeah, but it's not what you're really, now it's different. Now we've changed it, we, you know, because everything is an approximation, right? And she said, well, we'll, we'll change the Spanish. I mean, <laughs> so this is what I mean about, I mean, I wouldn't dare pretend to be the author of this text, right? I mean, she is the author. Um, but what does it, what do, how do I see myself as a translator? I'm not just an interpreter. I'm trying to get as close as I can to the, the gut of the work. Because this is where it grew. It grew in her soul. These words are part of who she is. Some of them I can identify with personally, but not all of them. So there was this back and forth process that would happen between us and eventually we would come out with a poem. Now the poem, the very sh the shortest one that we read, Añoro Palabras, when we were talking about silence and words not quite measuring up, not quite being able to get to where 
we want them to be, right? That originally was a 15 verse poem. And I think the, the result, the one that went to press has eight verses. I mean, we, all, we cut it in half because we kept on, the original was diverging and going in a lot of directions and we decided no, if we cut certain lines, then we'll be able to focus more on what it is we really want to say here. Sometimes that would happen, and other times, sometimes things could be very literal. But as Octavio Paz, another famous Mexican Nobel laureate, once said, literal translation is not impossible, but it's not a translation. No, <laughs> I mean, it, it's a Google version of a translation that might help you understand where it is, what it is that the author is saying if you don't have the expansive vocabulary, right? But it's not, it doesn't carry the soul of the author. Um, uh, yes, I just so beautifully, I, I loved your question. But I'd like to say briefly that um, uh, when, the, when the poem emerges, there's no precision. Um, and there's not a, uh, no compass, no GPS that will tell you where to go. And when I teach creative writing to my students, I tell them it doesn't matter where you go, it's the process when you get there. It's like, you know, the famous line, it's not arriving but, uh, to your destination, but it's a journey. It's, a, it's a, like they say in Europe, cheesy. I don't know what they say in America. It was, it's a cheesy way of explaining things. <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is the journey, the journey of words. And um, I am not interested in what can be understood. I am not interested in clarity. I am interested in ambiguity, in doubt, in uncertainty, because most of the answers that we seek So it's almost just imagine that when you are writing a poem, you're finding your way in a way in the darkness. But um, a, 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 a friend of mine, the late uh, Cuban writer, Oscar Iquero, she always used to say to me, but remember, Marjorie, that when you write in the darkness, all what you have to do is look out the window and see a door and see a, a light and someone is there waiting. And that was very beautiful what Oscar said, but I believe now I understand what he was trying to say. The one that is waiting is the reader. And we always, in a way, wait for that reader to, to join us. So that's what I have to say. Well, thank you so much for that lovely response. Does anyone else have any questions? Oh, yes, by the column. By the column. You talked about how you have different translators that you work with, and you noticed that the majority of them, are, all of them are women. Um, do you find that the closeness in lived experience of you with the translator has an impact on how you translate those things? So with someone who's a similar age, a similar lived experience to you as someone who's maybe younger and hasn't had the same experience. How does that relationship uh, kind of change and reform depending on the, the lived experience of you compared to the lived experience of the It's a very beautiful question. Um, I think um, a similar age, yes. Um, similar decade because uh, for example, when, when I teach Paolo Rivera's love poetry, my young, uh, wealthy students think that he's terrible, he's a misogynist, uh, he's a lousy poet, but my generation, or let's say between the ages of 40 to 80, everyone has, everyone has tried and grown up with those poems, but these young women, find them offensive, like when he says, like, um, 
I want you to be still as if you're silent. So a lot of young people believe that he doesn't he doesn't want women to speak. No. For me it's the idea of of the power and the simplicity of silence. But also in a way, none of the women that have translated my work um, are from my part of the, have spent a long time, let's say in Chile, in South America, but they are very familiar with Latin America, like uh, Jackie, like Celeste. Uh, they, they, they have their doctorates in Latin American literature, so they know. They, in a way, I think it's more important to know poets through literature than visiting places. Only literature knows how to explain things. If you read Russian literature, you know who the Russians are. So I just think that um, Celeste and Jack and, and Alison Ridley, they're very, very familiar with the Latin American world, but they are not in that world. But that is even better because it's got, it produces a distance. Now, if a, 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 a male translator would say, I am interested in your work, I would like to translate it, but they, they haven't. I'm sure it's like maybe women are more drawn to, to these experiences, although I think they are very much universal, nostalgia, memory, love. These are, these are humanities. Consolations, preoccupations, but um, I'm curious to know that they have not asked me to. I'm curious, I don't know why, but I'm not interested in the why. I think it's their problem. Not mine. <laughs> no. no, but clearly, there, there, I know some men who have translated women yes. poets, and they're fabulous. <laughs> You know, so I don't think gender is, is necessarily a limitation uh, when it comes to translation. Um, there has to be some kind of union of souls, some understanding that is intangible, really. You know, I mean, we actually co-authored an essay about writing together and translating we together. We should tell the title to eliminate. We should. Oh, well, no. We don't say that. We, we, we. <laughs> No, we've, we've done a lot together. Uh, we have I've translated uh, prose as well as poetry for Marjorie. And she's probably the most prolific author of her generation. She's published over 80 books. Wow. I mean, that's a lot of books. <laughs> um, there has to be, I mean, there is a union of souls between the two of us. My, my family origins are Mediterranean, which is very similar to the Latino. Latino culture, family-wise. Uh, I come from a Greek Orthodox background. She from the Jewish background. Yet, and I married a Jewish man. I mean, you know, I mean, we have these these places in our lives that have come together in very strange ways. I mean, the the there was a Greek physician, if I am if I'm recalling correctly who encouraged her father to apply for a Ford Foundation grant to leave Chile before her family left Chile. And this Greek doctor from Thessalonica, from Thessalonica my family's not from Thessalonica, it doesn't get very weird, but anyway, um, this Greek doctor helped them settle in Athens, Georgia. <laughs> I, there's, there are just all these little coincidences. That's all they really are. But we, we do share an awful lot in common beyond, beyond university and scholarship. I, I quickly, you know, we, we, we're not going to give names or nothing, but when we had this dialogue, uh, we, we wrote this essay together. One of the, the editors that invited, we listed the books we've done. And he told us, you have to delete all these books because, because you have done more than the person that has been honored. And so let's say, well, let's just wait a thing. And I I am a fighter. I always just have, everyone says, no, Marjorie, leave it alone. I can't leave it alone. <laughs> I can't. So I thought a lot, and a very a wonderful, uh, an amazing translator, it's like a mentor to me, Jonathan Cohen, was in Chile. 
and I told him the story. He says, don't leave it alone. Tell him that if he wants us not to put what we have done, but we didn't do it out of vanity. We wanted to share what was done, that you will remove the feet. Mm -hmm. I wrote to him, I said, you know, if you feel that we have to remove the work we've done together, then it's fine. Mm -hmm. And he, of course, had to accept the feet. But I have encountered such things. Uh, or when the president of the college was uh, being uh, inaugurated, they asked me to read. And I thought it was a great honor. But the next day they said to me, you know, Marjorie, all of a sudden we had to toss a coin. When they toss a coin, they are lying. It means like <laughs> a work in progress. They said, we toss a coin and we chose the male part. What do you say that you're not going to honor this wonderful president that we have? But these things, when they, I have like uh, a memory of these things because uh, they are frequent. They are not isolated cases. And I just hope that new generation of women don't face what we have faced. I really hope. Beautiful. Um, it's actually, unfortunately, we are out of time, but you can ask questions when you join the signing line after <laughs> after the event. Yeah. yeah. Um, if if we could just give one more one more little applause.